Today is March 10th, 2011, and we are interviewing Cheryl Adams from Storm Lake, Iowa at the Communications Center at Buenavista University. Mr. Adams was born on August 4th, 1922. My name is Lindsay Peterson, and I will be the interviewer along with Jennifer Jacobs. Okay, so sir, before you, were, before you entered the service and stuff like that, what were you doing before you were called up? I suppose just a labor, uh, whatever you could do back in them days, not much of anything really, painter, or worked on the farm or whatever you could find to do. And then you were drafted, weren't you? Yeah. Um, what branch were you drafted into? The Army. Okay. And then when you went to boot camp, can you talk to us what like boot camp was like? What kind of an experience that was for you? Well, it was all experience. Um, we was in Texas, out there with the scorpions and snakes and the poorest part of the country. And I don't know, I guess, I guess that'd be about the size of it, really. Uh, Just whatever you had to do, and they try to ask you to do, and you're learning all the time. They give you different uh, things. They trying to find out what you could do, and I guess I didn't have anything, so they put me in engineers. So after that, we just trained for that. And about the size of it, I guess, unless you got more answers or more questions for it. When you, um, when you got on the ship to go overseas, what were you, what were you feeling? Were you nervous? Were you scared? Can you talk a little bit about like what, what, the, what the life was like on the ship? Um, uh, I don't remember about, you know, being nervous, except you just tried to follow what they told you to do. Uh, I never volunteered for anything. Uh, we got on a Limey ship, or an English or Scottish ship, whatever you want to call them, and the meals wasn't worth a darn. Most of it was soup, pea soup or bean soup or lamb stew or something like that. Uh, after we was on there a while, we found out the, the balance uh, of the ship in the bottom had raisins in, so we had a lot of raisins we ate. And then I got to know some of the cooks and stuff, and then we got ice cream and stuff after midnight or when things quieted down, so uh, I guess that's, <laughs> that's part of that then. What did you do to pass your time on the ship? Well, I'm not a gambler, so I guess I just sat around twisting my thumb and talked to different guys and slept and there wasn't nothing else to do. We was in a convoy when we went across. Uh, you couldn't see all the ship, but you'd see one once in a while. And we was under fire, or partly supposed to have been under fire off and on by German boats, but it didn't happen that I know of. So you started waking up on that. That's about the size of that for um when you when you you know when you got overseas, can you talk to us about like you know your first combat experience, what you guys did as soon as you you know got there um, stuff like that? Well, we went to England to start with, and I was there about nine months, and they had training of bridge building and uh, explosive and you know all that. Uh, stuff, uh, and in your spare time you went to town, uh, they couldn't keep you busy all the time, you'd done, done quite a bit of sightseeing. Uh, I seen quite a little England by going on trains here and there, and that was a big experience. Uh, so they had a lot of tea over there. And their fish and chips, I, 
I'd still like to get some of them. I mean, you never got tired of them. I never did, anyhow. And a lot of them Englishmen, they didn't like us, of course, when they went their daughters. Why well, that didn't help matters any either. So I had one girl I went with about six months over there, and I suppose I could have brought her back if I wanted to, but I didn't want to split her up from her mother. So. I guess that's about the size of that, too. Or so then while you were stationed in England, did you learn about um, where you were about to go to see, you know, actual combat? When did you get your orders and stuff like that? Um, you knew it was coming. You didn't know when. Uh, I guess we was ready to go. We, uh, the engineers didn't uh, fight. Uh, as far as carrying a gun while we carried just little carbines. Uh, you know, even all through Germany, that's all we carried. If, uh, we wasn't supposed to shoot anybody or shoot at anybody. We was bridge building and uh, the, that's what the other guys are supposed to be doing was uh, shooting and that. Um, they kept telling us, you know, well, you knew everything was coming for the bomb in London and all that, and blitz bombs and that, so you knew it was coming sometime, but you didn't really know when. So just one day they picked us up and said, you're going, so you went across then. So then did you go across um, in the invasion of Normandy then? Is that what you did? Uh, I didn't go in to Germany or France until 30 days after D-Day. There's only in 20 miles to the town of Carentan. Uh, and we sat there for you know, about a week, I suppose. And when we did go into Carentan, we was under fire the first afternoon. You could see the shells and stuff landing out to the side of us there. And uh, that particular night, like I told him, there was 280 guys killed across the road from us, just, you know, just the other side there. So you um, got, got the experience pretty quick. It, uh, you started learning how to dig a foxhole damn fast. So, and then they, like I told him, they had to back uh, about 10.30 in the morning they had to break through at St. Lowe, and we was so close to it, the bombs looked like fence posts coming out of the planes, and you couldn't stand up. You had to be leaning against the concussion that was going back, and the next morning that's when the breakthrough at St. Lowe was, and that's, that's when it really got, got going. Bridge building, we was ahead of the infantry and the tanks and all of that, uh, putting the bridges, the baileys, and infantry. We had infantry assault boats, so we was using them, taking the guys across the rivers and bringing them back, and, and never got a scratch all the or a shot or anything in, in that length of time. So. Well. There's uh, a lot of the major rivers, I can't remember all of them that we, creeks and major rivers we did work on. Moselle, and I, I can't think of all of them now. I got some maps there at home of the routes we had, and, and then they had papers like that they put out with them old, uh, old instructions and stuff on them. You're supposed to throw all of them away, but. I kept some, I still got a bunch of them at home where you had the routes on there. So. As you were, you know, building the bridges and stuff like that, was there a combat going on or like all around you? Or how, how was that, you know, what happened when you were doing those kinds of things? We, there were seven battle stars given in the European theater, and I had five of them. So there was combat 
mo most most of the time, and if it wasn't from the men, it was the old women sitting on the front porch with an air rifle, shooting the guys in the temple as they drove by. So it was it was spooky. You could you couldn't trust any of the, especially the German people. The French wasn't so bad, but the Germany when they was in through there, you couldn't trust trust any of them. A lot of the French was real helpful, you know, on uh, helping you out and and giving you oh well, eggs and chickens and eating stuff. You'd trade your candy bars and stuff for for what they had and. They, especially in Germany, well, in France too, you had to turn in all your, they were supposed to turn in all their guns and stuff ahead of time into the mayor or the burgomaster. And we had all assessed uh, any, any and all of them that we wanted, all you had to do just go in and you'd have rooms this big of uh, old brownings, all gold inlaid stuff and all of that. And you just go in and pick one up, whatever you wanted. but. Uh, with driving a truck, you didn't have room for uh, that kind of stuff. I did bring back a Browning automatic nine millimeter that I carried under shoulder holster most of the time. It's lucky to get it back though. You said that you had five battle stars. Do you remember the names of the specific battles that you were in? Or you know, how did that feel when you got those battle stars? Well, I can't I can't think what they are now. Um, I I can't uh, what the number of it was. There's Ryan and of course the Battle of the Bulge, and I can't think what the other three or four was. But we was constantly under fire most most all time while where I was anyhow. You just mentioned the Battle of the Bulge. Can you tell us what that was like, what your experience was when you were there? Um. Well, it was exciting. Uh, if there's some pictures here, if you when we get through or whatever, you can look at them and see what what it was like, or natural pictures there. Um, it was colder than hell, and we didn't have any more than what your boys got on right there for warm clothes. Uh, and you slept wherever you could, uh, or anyhow you could. I carried uh, you know, sleeping bags and whatever, and. Uh, comforters out of the house you get some of them big old thick comforters and uh, and you always carried uh, a, rock, a rock or two and throw them on the fire at night and then throw that in your sleeping bag and stuff with you and I drove trucks so I uh, cut out part of the floorboard and made a funnel coming off of my manifold and stuff right up into me to uh, for the heat and stuff. And uh, one of the motor pool guy was going to have me turned in for disassembling a truck or whatever you want to call it, but it never did go through, I guess. So you had to look out for yourself. Captain Gladhill said that you were in um, Bastogne. Can you talk about your experience there? Well, it was cold there, a lot of snow. Um, for one deal on Christmas Day, this wasn't Bastogne, this was Liege. Uh, we went through this one town and stopped and well, a girl was standing there uh, in the door and of course you're always talking or whatever 
and uh, and we got ready to go while we kept on going. But the captain come by and seen me talking to her, and we got paid that day. And as I was going through the line, he said, "Would you like to take my jeep back and have Christmas dinner with them people?" And I said, "Well, sure." So it was only about. I don't know, three or four or five blocks, whatever, very short time we stayed in that town that night. So I went back and had Christmas dinner with them. And we got paid that day too. That was, I can't think what year it was now, but that was a Christmas day. And no place to spend their money, so that was out too. Um, it was, Bastogne, we was surrounded by Germans. Um, I guess we really didn't know, but we was. Uh, and it was just colder and colder than heck there at that particular time. But we got a breakthrough. We went on through somewhere, I can't remember. And probably about that particular time, it took us 48 hours to put up one bridge. The Bailey Bridge, we'd put it up in the dark, and um, the next morning there was a tank, two mornings in a row, a tank was sitting over there in the evergreen trees, and the first morning they didn't catch it, but it rode the bridge up on us, and uh, so we went back and we we didn't really didn't put the bridges up, we just had the the equipment we had to make darn sure we had all the pins and everything, extra pins and that, and the combat engineers put the bridges up, but we helped. We had to have everything to do it, and we'd help tell them how to do it if they didn't know. And uh, the tank blowed the first bridge up, and then it blowed the other one up on us. Finally, we got the third one, but the snow gave them away for when the second morning or third morning uh, they could see where the tank was and it shook the evergreens, and so he didn't last long. But, uh, and then while I'm thinking of that, there's a lot of snipers over there in the rural, rural area, the coal country, where they had the big tank, uh, buckets and stuff going around through there. The Germans would climb up in there, the snipers would, and uh, snipe you off if they could. And that was interesting when they found out what one of them was in that cut loose with their 50 calibers and that kind of stuff, and they just shine. You know, it was. Uh, I'd hate to been in there for the ring and like a big bell was. So it was. Yeah. About how long did it take to put up one of the bridges that you helped with? It depended on how many pieces there was to it and how long it was and how you had to put it across. Uh, you'd build it on this side and had to take a big bullnoser and push it over and and then it bounced on the other side. It depended on the situation of the train or whatever it was to do it. It was easy to put up. They just had the sides and big pins and everything fitted right together. It was a back-breaking back deal. You had to carry all of it. Uh, but. It was, they had it pretty well down, pretty simple to do. You had to make sure you had all the pins and stuff for the guys to do it with, though. While you were there, um, I know that Patton was in charge. What was that like? Did you ever have any experiences with him? What did you think of him? You know, just being the normal, being a normal so soldier, you know, what did, what did you think of him? Um, the time I did meet him, he was a nice guy. Uh, we was sitting in, I think, France. Well, when they had the breakthrough of St. Lowe, that was his big deal at the breakthrough. It, it was, I can't, the 6th, I believe, 10.30 in the morning, there was 2,500 bombers come besides the fighter planes that had the breakthrough. And the next day, that's when we took off and and went down through there. Uh, we happened to be sitting along a road uh, waiting to move, which we 
did set quite a bit and move. A lot of night driving we had to do. And we were setting earth or helmets off. Uh, and he come along there and he just happened to stop and he he didn't he wasn't a preacher. And he told us to get our helmets on, so we said okay and then we knew right who and he was for he had his double pistols on and he said that feels so damn good with her helmets off, I'm gonna take mine off. So he took his off and stood there and talked to us a little bit and then he decided to go on. But that's the only time that I know that I'd ever been that close to him. That he had a job to do and he got it done. So you made your way through France and you started to make your way into Germany. Did you notice that the people were much more hostile toward you, the Germans, or how did that feel? Were you more anxious as you entered that area, or? You know, I think you could probably tell right to the border if you had time to set and stop. The, the, the French people was real friendly, uh, especially the girls. <laughs> I don't know how it comes to say, uh, glad, glad to see you and, and all that, uh, and so was the women. Hell, it, you run up to your truck and kiss you and hug you and you know just just happy to to have what and you when well, you're talking about the French when we first had the breakthrough there in France there was livestock and stuff laying on the road that was killed and they'd be laying there when you go by one time you come back the next time the hams and the loins and everything would be gone so it was uh, and as far as privacy or anything like that, the, the women had no privacy. The toilets was no, uh, when you went, you went. You didn't give a damn where you was and who you was. So whether you guys want to know that or not, but that's what the situation was. Uh, there's no, no embarrassment, uh, especially in France. And that was a dirty country. Uh, a lot of it was, you know, it, the drains went right by the front door, the back door, the horses and the cattle and the horses in one side of the house and the people and the cattle was in the other side and the hogs were just right on the other side there too. You didn't drink uh, any of their water there. All you had was their wine and cognac and that stuff. Matter of fact, I carried a five gallon can on my truck and that's all it was in it was wine most of the time so it was it was free you go in them cellars and they're just big barrels and barrels and barrels and uh, you could have been an alcoholic if, if you'd wanted to so. as you were building bridges did you take part in building the Rhine River Bridge did I? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> yeah, we did. Uh, we was the first ones there. There's a picture here of our infantry assault boats that we took people, the infantry, across the river to start with to establish a head over there. And then we hauled the stuff for the Remington Railroad Bridge that uh, they blowed up. And that was the first place I'd seen a jet airplane. And that thing went up and down that river just like a shot. That uh, looked about like one of them blitz bombs or whatever, only you could see it. Uh -uh. Yeah. Did you know what it was? When huh? You, did you know what it was when you saw it? I don't think we probably did to start with. Uh, it, uh, word probably didn't take long for it to get out. Uh, I can't remember, but I, I can still see it going, going up river there. So, did it just make a couple of passes? Did it? Did it? Uh, just, uh, just one pass. Yeah, it just made one pass up through there, and you wondered what what it was. So, and that's the only one that I ever seen over there. Yeah. When you were 
you know, in your foxhole at night, can you describe what that was like? Were you all, I mean, was there a lot of like bombings that were going on at that time? Did you feel uneasy? Were you able to get a lot of sleep? <laughs> what was that like? <laughs> oh, the first night in France when they, our Bailey bridges had big I-beams on them and, uh, and our trailers and stuff, we crawled underneath there and you could hear the stuff bouncing around here and there. So it was scary, it was spooky. It made you wonder what, what could happen. And there's other times that you did dug foxholes and uh, depends on where you was. Uh, but most of the time I stayed under the, between the trailer wheels and the big I-beams because there wasn't a whole lot of area around there that, except ground shrapnel that would get you. But it was, it was spooky. Do you remember if there was a lot of casualties in your unit? Did you lose any friends during the war? You said that you yourself weren't wounded, but did you see anything? We lost uh, quite a few guys. Um, we wasn't supposed to do any shooting or anything, so the ones that was killed were snipers or uh, shrapnel. I carried a duffel bag on the driver's side of my truck and I still got it at home and it's got shrapnel holes in it. So that was, uh, I guess about the closest I ever come to being killed is one time I was sitting beside a building waiting to unload and they got the big outside chimneys on and somebody, or the chimneys got shot and all the bricks and stuff fell in the back of my truck like from me to you. And there, all the top of the cab was that canvas top. So I'm sure if I'd been another four foot back, I'd have been under that stuff. That's as close as I can say it as was killed or hurt or anything. How did you stay in touch with your family and friends back home? Well, what I did write back, they couldn't read it, so it was damn hard to keep in touch with them. But uh, like the different towns uh, over there, you would write something on the little cards about this and that, uh, like the town of uh, Troy over there. Uh, the town I was from had a guy's name by Jim Troy and I told them that I seen uh, Jim Troy or Jim uh, today, so they followed you with that or the sentence you started out with Nancy or put the names in a big bigger number or bigger letter on there, and then they could kind of follow you that way. Um, but there's no other way you could keep track, you know. Um, that I knew of anyhow. I wasn't smart enough to uh, do a lot of that secret service stuff. Mm. When you found out that you were about to be discharged, how did you feel about that? Were you ready to go home? And then when you got back home, what was that like readjusting to the life of a civilian again? Well, it was good to see all the, the folks. Um, I didn't have the best taste in the world, and then I needed another operation, or needed an operation. And they wanted you to stay in service and get that done. The government took care of it, and I told them, hell no, I've had it this long, I might as well take it home with me. So I, I, I did bring it back with me. Uh, and I, I, I never wanted to go, but when it was time to get out, I was willing to get out. I'm probably different than a lot of people, but that's my, that's my feelings. Um, and some of the things that 
you know, we talked on the phone earlier. You mentioned that you went on an honor flight to D.C. Yeah. Will you talk about what that was like for you to see the, you know, the war monument that's there and stuff like that? That was exciting, too. Interesting. Just like the service. Uh, hadn't been for the government and free, I'd never got it done. Uh, it was appreciated everything that hy V done for us. There's a bunch of good people above. They'd made their money and they spent it that way and we all thanked them for it. And, and there was a nice bunch of people to talk to and I guess they took their high hat off and come down with us and uh, was just like we are. So I appreciated it and we even when we got back to Des Moines, me and my, well, my brother, he was in service too, but he was up in the Lucian Islands, about very few miles from uh, Russia up there. So we both went on uh, honor flights together. His boy worked at Des Moines and we had some pulls down there, he did. So they got us two on the same flight and the same bus and all of that. And when we were getting on and off the bus all the time, well, this one guy, looked for the Adams boys and there we was most of the time around there somewhere. So it's, yeah. What did you think of the memorial itself? Uh, uh, the it was, monument? yeah, it was uh, all interesting. Uh, I, I don't know, I'm not too good at expressing anything, but I guess it's the best, uh, best you can do. Uh, it was, um, it was, well, what they'd done, you know, with, with, our, with their money or our money or whatever. And it, it's there forever, unless it gets bombed, you know, out or whatever. Uh, a lot of, lot of work went into it, a lot of money. Yeah, that's. Well, I don't, I don't know yet. When you were back home and you heard about, you know, the victory in Japan, you know, how did you feel at that time? Did you, were you, you know, really excited? You know, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, yeah, you'd be excited for there's no more, no more war there. You'd, you'd, you didn't have to worry about your life only accidental or whatever. Uh, we was, well, they pulled us out of the Battle of the Bulge or it was over with, and they pulled us out and sent us on uh, oh, light duty or whatever you want to call it. So they put uh, straw in, in our trucks and put a five gallon can of nitroglycerin in each quarter, corner and the center, and that's what we hauled uh, as being uh, what do you want to call them on our rec recreation or whatever freedom? And hell, that was more dangerous than, than the war was with five cans of nitroglycerin sitting in there. And just after that, they started sending us down to Nice and Marseille, France to go over to Japan. And that's when we heard it was over with on the way down to there. So. It was a good thing to get that over with and rest up a while. Yeah. Was the training that you took place in for Japan, was it different than that training that you took place in, you know, back in boot camp? Did they teach you, you know, different tactics? No, there was no, no training to it. We were just on rec, uh, recreation and got an order to go and you just, just ordered. I, I guess they figured we had enough experience to to go down there or they needed help or whatever. I don't know what the deal was. Yeah. Are there any other stories that, you know, you would like to talk about or something that you forgot to mention or we forgot to ask? Oh, I don't know. There's things that come up though. He's talking there. Uh, one when he's 
crossed uh, one river there, and then we left there. And you go out through the fields, you know, driving. Uh, we went out through there, and there's a, a house setting out in the country, there, a great, great big house below a cliff. And what brought it to me, your tank man here was talking about it. Uh, in front of that house, there was two German tanks on fire burning when we drove up there. And not too far away, there's American tanks that was having problems too. And we, me and Bauer, grabbed her cots and went in that house that night. When we come out the next morning, there was dead Germans in the straw pile there on the front door. And uh, when we put her cots up that night, I kicked something that, uh, the rock, or we didn't know what it was. Uh, got up the next morning, there's a hand grenade laying over there, a dud that hadn't gone off. I can still remember that. I kicked it on the right foot, and, and we said, well, we're lucky there. And back on behind the cliff, the snipers had, was, had all kinds of, of uh, uh, pots and stuff built up where they were staying. And we sat there for a couple of days and got to see all that. And we went up around the, their trails. We didn't get off the trails, but we went up around the trails. And, and there were dead Germans laying all over. Uh, that was one time. Another time I can think we stopped along the road is all night driving. And uh, I stepped out of my truck and I stepped on something soft and I didn't know what, what it was. Uh, but then you got out and started feeling around and felt the stuff. And then you'd, it was a German there. You could feel the way the insignias and his, uh, coats and stuff was. It would run over right there on the road. And that, uh, what was it like driving at night? Hell. Were you driving completely blacked out or did you have the little black? Yeah, we had the little lights, you know, little oblong lights there, yeah. And that's what most of our driving was, was uh, uh, night driving. One time, you talk about that, I was, you know, he's probably tired or whatever. This one time I was tired and I was sitting there in my truck, went to sleep, and here come a, one of the, the corporal or somebody along and tapped me on the shoulder and say, you know, wake up, let's go. So I did, but they always checked the whole line to make sure everybody was awake and a going. Uh, otherwise, you just drove all night or whatever, and you was you was tired most of the time. So it was, yeah. Right. So what did you do during the day? Uh, if you drove a lot at night, what did you do at the, during the day? Did you uh, did you just sit tight and wait for the night to come, or did you drive? Mm, yeah, you you, you sat there and, and waited uh, for your time to come. Uh, and two little cycles that I showed you, uh, me and Scray had them, and we would get on them and ride around uh, through the part of the country or whatever we could. We was always trading chocolate and pineapple and that stuff for chickens and eggs and, and that kind of stuff. And we'd done quite a bit of riding around just for that, going to houses and just like walking in here, you'd take whatever was there that you wanted that you could carry and and take it, uh, jewelry or uh, blankets or forks or knives or any of that kind of stuff. But you can only handle so much, so you and then if you did take it, you left it and picked up something else somewhere else. So you you had your freedom. Uh, at uh, one time. Uh, we was looking around this old barn that had a whole bunch of corn up there, or wheat, and I was kicking around in it, and there's a pair of uh, black dress boots that they wore, and I was going to take them, and that German, he cried, and he said, oh, don't take them, and this and that, and I said, okay, you can have them, and left them there, but, uh, you know, you just, you had all the freedom, especially in Germany. There was no... Uh, yeah. 
these here is the Siegfried line between Germany and France where they had them for years and didn't think anybody would go across them, but they did. They just made roads up over the top and no problems. Go ahead and then. And this is one of the big theaters or USO deals where they have shows and stuff. Let's see, this is Nuremberg. That's a big uh, Nuremberg Stadium here. And that was old Pop Knox. He was about the oldest guy in the bunch. How old yeah. was he? Oh, I can't remember now, I suppose. Probably 30, 40, uh -huh. probably 40 at that yeah, time. Probably pretty ancient. Yeah. And there's a house we was in. That there's them little cycles that we had. Where did you uh, get the Where'd you get the bikes out? Were they just laying? Just like going up here at the Honda shop and and get them. Uh, I had a big Indian before one time, and you couldn't handle that. But these little ones is you could pick them up and throw them up on your load or whatever. They just had a little gas engine, and you had to pedal them to get them started. So. That's, yeah, that's, where's, uh, yeah, that's one of the bridges we was working on, I believe. Uh, the way it looks from here, anyhow. This is a Nuremberg, I believe it is, ain't it? Yep. Yeah, yep. this is a Nuremberg the Motel, and there it is afterwards. Yep. And here's a stadium in Nuremberg. Oh, Hitler used to give speeches out of this corner up here. And I'm not sure what them pictures are. This guy here, his name was Coke. Remember that? Did you have other guys from Iowa in your unit? Or were you at? Oh, we had a Mahoney from down by Iowa City, but <clears throat> that's the only one that I know of. <coughs> this is up there in the Battle of the Bulge. A uh, little snow, a lot of snow on the ground. <coughs> now, are these guys that you knew in the picture? Yeah, they was guys that I knew. Mm -hmm. I can't think what their names are now. Were they were they in the 72nd or were they in other units you just knew? No, it was in our, in yours? yeah, okay. it was in our company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these, all these guys was in the, in the same company I was. It looks really cold. It was cold <laughs> and we had nothing for shoes or jackets or anything, only our wool pants and underwear that you could find, uh, whatever. Yeah, it was cold. was this one taken at? It looks like he's sitting on a, uh, a gun of some That's sort. That's a pillbox, I believe. Probably a German pillbox uh, he's sitting on there. Seven second engineers. And, uh, there'd be times we wouldn't see the anything from headquarters for two or three weeks at a time. We just had our orders and, and go that way. This is a, a bridge. I don't know which one it was now. I can't, well, it's, this so is a Moselle. in front of bridge. There. Yeah, this is a Moselle River here. And there's a Pomme de Terre and I can't remember all of them. This is a railroad bridge there at Nern, that, uh, Rhine River. Now, is this you and your truck? Or is that someone else there? It says no, on. I can't tell you. It says on PW run with Snubby Muck, Marseille. Yeah, they huh. sometimes they'd unload their trucks and put us on uh, P 
PW runs hauling guys back and forth. Uh, we did liberate one camp in, in Sar Union over there of a German uh, prisoner war camp. Oh, okay. Uh, we took two guys back from there back to the mess house or whatever, and they couldn't eat as much as what you could hold in your hands. They just skin and bones. Never got their names or anything, you know. Always wishing you did later on, but you never. You just, you know, you just yeah. forget. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is a railroad bridge across the Rhine River too. I believe it is. Well, yeah, that's just some of the people we met over there. This one here, I went with her for about six months over there. Oh. I could have probably brought her back, but I didn't want to break her from her mother. Oh. Or maybe vice versa, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, wow. Yeah, there's all kinds of you know, people you can meet over there, you did meet anyhow. I don't see a picture in here of that gal up in uh, Belgium there. There's one right there that says Belgium, is that her? No. Um, she was an Amish or an Amish uh, person. They wore the big long skirts and, mm -hmm. and hair all bundled up and that. Uh, Amish or whatever you want to call them, a hook and button outfit or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bobby had took my old book and took it to Pier and st started being one of them book clubs or whatever, you know, doing that. And so she's got a lot of my pictures out there. Uh. Never did get the book finished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kids, what are you going to do, huh? <laughs> yeah. This is the Battle of the Bulge, I believe, yeah. Mm. I don't know what the ideas they had us out there in that snow and stuff for. We didn't have nothing else to do, so I suppose they done that. <laughs> Let's see, is that the Remington Bridge? It says location of where the pontoon bridge was across the Rhine River. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is uh, yeah, that was across the Rhine. That was a pretty hot time over there. Yeah. Now this one says on the move. Is this uh, the trucks with your? Yeah, that's our infantry assault boat. Each one of them is a boat. And they would set butt to butt like this table and go twice as big and uh, paddle uh, guys across. And, you know, that Rhine River uh, and several of the others Sometime was just about the color of that chair of the blood and stuff. Uh, a lot of gas cans and stuff floating up and down and dead horses and hogs and cattle and uh, GIs and Germans, you know. It, it, uh, yeah. Uh, it was interesting, guys. <laughs>